Welcome to the Fustel Fit Podcast with your host, Nicola Fustel. Straight talking, body positive coach and personal trainer. Nicola brings you your weekly guide to finding real health and fitness and to live the life you deserve. Welcome everybody to episode 17 with Trish Blackwell, confidence coach from the US. Now, this episode is super short and I didn't even get to ask her half the questions that I had planned, but me being me and getting all the time zones mixed up, we had to cut it short today, so hopefully we'll be able to do a part two very soon. So who is Trish Blackwell? Well, Trish Blackwell is a recognized fitness professional committed to inspiring others to live with more confidence, health and happiness from the inside out. Particularly passionate about bringing hope to those who struggle with negative body image, eating disorders or confidence issues. Blackwell has become the leader on image issues in the fitness industry. Personal trainer, author, podcaster and app publisher, Trish inspires her community to conquer life with confidence. Trish Blackwell is the author of The Skinny Sexy Mind, The Ultimate French Secret, a book on transforming one's body and life through discovering the key to confidence. Also available is her Amazon best-selling Kindle ebook, Building a Better Body Image, 50 Days to Loving Your Body from the Inside Out, a 50-day journey to living healthier and happier. Trish spends her free time running, surfing and snowboarding with her husband Brandon, Sinan and baby girl Ellie. She loves unicorns, coffee and the colour pink. Welcome Trish Blackwell to the show. Good morning. Good morning to you and thanks so much for your time this morning. Oh my gosh, yeah, my pleasure. I was, you know, it's, it's, it's like a treat to wake up early in the morning and be like, I'm connecting with a soul sister on the other Aww, side of the world. On the other side of the you world, know? yeah. It's awesome. And I was actually gonna congratulate you on your baby, but I had no idea she was two already. Yeah, we'll, think, well, she's not quite two. She's 20, 21 months old, which at this point, and she's so independent, she might as well be a two-year-old. So, yeah, yeah it's crazy. I'm obviously time a flies. little bit behind on all of your podcasts. Yeah. I need some catching oh, up. It's a, time flies. It's crazy. But anyway, can I just ask you then just to tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, and how you got into doing the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, um I am in the Washington DC area here in the United States and I grew up in the area and I grew up, um, actually as, as, as a high level athlete, very successful. I had Olympic dreams that were very realistic at one point. And, um, you know, I really built this world around my body and I had the, you know, I ate, I had a six pack and was this like perfect little athlete and then puberty hit, right? So, you know, puberty changes their body. And I was a swimmer and in, in the water, all of a sudden it wasn't as, you know, hydrodynamic. Like I, I, I blamed my performance on my body changing. And I thought, well, what's the answer? Okay, the answer is if I'm going to have these Olympic dreams, if I'm going to be special the way I think I'm supposed to be special, I need to swim faster, which means I need to lose more weight. Like my body's changing and becoming a woman, but I will change it back. And so that's what got me into this sort of like, well, I mean, to be honest, I did every eating disorder under the sun um, and became compulsive exerciser on top of my highly intensive workouts mm -hmm. um, and training. But then, um, you know, got engaged with, with some days I would not eat. It would be anorexia. And the Sundays was binge eating disorder. Um, and that went on from really through high school and college. And the whole time I maintained, you know, I was swimming and I was a full scholarship at college to swim. And, um, you know, it really obviously impacted my performance, but I was so into in like sick that I, I didn't think I could ever break free. I just thought that that's what life was going to be. Right. And so I was actually in college. I was a French major. And I, after I, I finished in um, school, I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I ended up moving to Europe. I moved to France so I could use my French. And that's like, honestly, my first book is about how France changed my life. And, and really it, in a nutshell, rescued me from having my eating sore. It gave me freedom from eight to eight to 10 years of struggling to love myself, struggling to feel like I was stuck in someone else's body, you know, and on the outside, what was so interesting is that, you know, I was that all American athlete. I was this, um, I didn't look like I had any body issues. And that was, I think for me, what makes me so passionate about what I do now. I think most of the women that struggle with this and men, um, a lot of the times the, the people who struggle the most are the ones who are perfectionists and on the outside, it looks like we have it all together. And, and so we can keep up our sickness and it's, mm -hmm. and it's, it's 
debilitating. It's life stealing. So I went to Europe. I came back. I spent a year there and I went, okay, I have to share this with people. And that's what it got me into the, into the fitness industry. I began personal training and, um, helping people. And I've been in, I was in the fitness industry exclusively for eight years. And, um, I still consider myself as part of the industry, but I realized in that industry that the industry was missing things. We were helping people who were overweight, but we were helping people who wanted to compete or lose that last five pounds. And we were kind of in a way, I, at least from what I saw, selling them packaged eating disorders of like, you know, like we're counting our hydro, like I need you to dehydrate for your photo shoot and this and like different things. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, this is what I'm, I'm here to not to help people not do this because I'm, I'm very passionate in, yeah, in your passionate. story that you've already been there and done it and recovered before you got into the industry because for a lot of yeah. people the industry then gave them the eating disorder exactly well I, you know and I resisted I had a lot of pressure because I am a mesomorph and, and I'm naturally muscular I had a lot of pressure from a lot of people to say Trish you should be competing Trish you should be competing and girl I was uh, thankfully I was well enough in my mind to say that's for me competing and doing, you know, and, and that was one of my dreams. You think, oh, to be a professional, like to really be acknowledged in the personal training world, I need to be on the cover of a magazine. Well, to be on a cover of a magazine, I need to compete. So that was really the motivation. I wanted that acknowledgement, but I was at least well enough in my mind to acknowledge that my eating disorder, my, my, my body image issues is like, it's like an, it's like alcoholism. It's, it's like a, an alcoholic's not going to walk into a bar and think that they're going to have this great strength. I knew that I couldn't enter the field of competition, you know, in fitness and not bring back on full blown another eating disorder. You know, the temptation for me would have just been too, too, too known, too comfortable. And so when I saw that that was going on, I was like, hold on, like the, this industry of people who are claiming to be so confident and we're helping other people get confidence. We're actually teaching them body image issues and insecurity because that's what we're and I realize that at the end of the day there's a lot of fear right and and there's a lot of there's a lot of really beautiful fit people trying to help other people who don't know how to help themselves because they're so afraid that their body's not perfect enough and that their definition of value lies in their body being perfect and that girl is when I started realizing that okay I think confidence is at the bottom of all this. And I realized I was thinking about um I oversaw a large group of trainers I, I was um a managing of trainers and developing trainers. So I, I probably worked with developing 500 trainers and between the trainers I developed and my clients who had weight loss and, and also like major weight loss, hundred pounds or, you know, competition ready weight loss. Um, the, I was, the workouts were different. The coaching of how I trained the trainers was different, but the same thing was consistent and that everyone was insecure that bottom that that ground fundamental thing that i saw that would really change someone is if i could get them to change their thoughts about themselves and their and to go from insecurity to confidence to security in themselves and it's funny because I, I to my knowledge confidence coaching didn't exist before i started and i was like well i just and i didn't even at first had the confidence to to do confidence coaching to call it that but i, I just felt like it was the right thing to do because I knew it could help people and it needed, I needed to help people like myself. Yeah. And did you also have a coach? I did. I've been working with, um, well, and you know, I've had a, a variety of things. I've worked with therapists, uh, um, which I think is extremely, extremely important to have, um, clinical therapy, mm-hmm. but then also, um, my mentor in the fitness industry has been Todd Durkin. Brilliant. And what about body positivity? What are your thoughts on that? How, how do you define body positivity? You know, that's in, it, it's interesting. But, um, I I think body positivity is loving your body for what it does and for how beautiful it is, whatever that shape looks like that day. I will say that the there is a dangerous side to that. If you're if someone's body isn't healthy, and there's a body positivity to say this is how I am, I'm why should I even make an effort to change? I think that then becomes um, a scapegoat. It's an excuse. But body positivity, I absolutely believe that every day. We should embrace our bodies. And that's what I spent so many years not doing. I thought I can be positive about my body and love my body in five pounds, right? Or in 2% body fat difference and or next week. We always put off and that that prevents us from being able to live in the present. And we find joy and peace and life and confidence and, and real living when we can be in the present. And if we don't have that ability to be okay with our bodies in that day, well, then we're never going to be able to be in the present. So I do think it's good. I think it can be dangerous. Just like people use 
anything as a, as a scapegoat or a justification to say, well, I'm not going to make enough for a change because what's the point? I love myself for how I am. You should. Yes. But there are certain things to to know that like, okay, if you're eating too much sugar, then that, well, let's, you know, it's not an issue of changing what your body looks like. Let's honor the body. If you have body positivity, honor it for what you're really putting into it and what chemicals you're putting on it and around it. I mean, it needs to be the whole package. Yeah. And what about health at every size? Mm, I absolutely believe there can be health at every size. Um, and that's one, you know, my, my specialty in, in when I was full-time personal training was working with, um, hundred plus pound weight loss and then the last five pounds. So I really with the spec and, and people with eating disorders or body image issues. So I really had this spectrum, um, of people, um, but really the same issue is how do we accept our body size and health at any size? And I, I think health at any size means, have you done something today? to honor and improve your health. And you know, with, with me and my podcast community, we're all about how to be more, the be more movement. Mm-hmm. Body health for me, health at every size means whatever your size is right now, have you done a little bit more to be a better version of that? Have you, how have you invested in your health that day? Have, is health, have you done your 10 minutes of yoga? Like, are you honoring the mobility of your body? I don't, I don't think health at any size means that you get to tap out and not take care of your body. What about health in terms of your emotional health or your mental health? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's the most important. I really do believe that when you are emotionally strong and you have emotional internal health, that internal success, you're going to get that external success physically. Really? When there's a disconnect between the mind and the body, your body, you're never going to know how to love your body. So I, I really spend a lot of time helping people connect their mind with their body when I work on them one-on-one. Okay. And with the work that you do on confidence, can you just explain yeah. exactly what confidence means to you? Yeah, absolutely. So to me, confidence is this, I mean, honestly, it's the decision to know that you are exactly who you're meant to be and that you don't need to change that. You just need to keep showing up in life every day to be the best version of you that you can be. It means it means being committed to personal growth and knowing that you can't. You are who you're meant to be. That we spend so much time comparing ourselves and trying to change ourselves to be like somebody else that we're throwing away our ability to have confidence. Confidence is a choice to actually. To me, it's a confident. It's a choice to live well. Like it's a, it's a choice to say, I'm going to just engage in life and live it to the fullest. And that means I'm going to love people. I'm going to, I'm going to be engaged. I'm going to fulfill my purpose. I'm going to pursue serving others. I'm just going to, I'm going to stop wasting so much emotional energy being insecure and worrying if I look fat or if, um, someone so likes me and I'm just going to be me. And then when I can be myself, I can be free to actually live life well and love others well. And when we think about going out in the world as our true self and doing all of the things we want to do. Normally that's when we get self-doubt and um, our fear kicks in about what people will think. So do you have any like tips of getting over doing, yeah. having those fears and then actually just going ahead with what it is you want to do? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I think I think my tip on getting over fear is to, is to know that you're going to have fear no matter what. And that when you are vulnerable like that, you are living well. Like something Todd Durkin taught me was, it, it Trish, if you're scared, it means you're playing in the right stratosphere. You know, you, it, you know, you're doing something. If you're comfortable, you're probably not going to do much with your life or with your personal growth or with your, with your voice or with your story that I think everybody's life has a story that they're supposed to tell. And if you're not even feeling a little bit of like, oh my gosh, am I going to be exposed like that? You, then you're probably not living out that purpose. You know, so I think, I think making friends with fear, fear is going to be part of our life no matter what. And you're either going to run from it, which means you're going to run from life. Or you're going to walk along with it and say, I'm comfortable with you. Like, it's cool. You're not going to scare me. I'm just going to keep leaning into it. And, you know, I've really prescribed to trying to do um, what Eleanor Roosevelt um, has has said in the past is saying, do one thing every day that scares you. I want to be so good at facing fear that when I really do feel fear, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not waved by it. I, I can press on and, and say, listen, I practice facing fear every day. You know, because a lot of fears just chatter in our mind that really is non nonsensical. I think it's um, it's like getting in your comfort zone, isn't it? So even if you face yeah. a few fears, you then get used to facing them, but then you still need to step out and do something new all of the time. Exactly. So what's the scariest fear that you've had to overcome? 
Gosh, the scariest fear. Um, you know, and I'll share. Um, it's what I just shared about in my um, uh, my, one of my most recent episodes of Confidence on the Go, episode number one hundred eighty six. Was um, I had a fear? You know, my childhood fear, my uh, adolescent fear, was being attacked and and assaulted by a stranger. And um, in that episode, I share how that happened. You know, what to do when your worst fear in the world happens. You know, and and you want to give up on life and. It was really, um, and, and I'd encourage anybody to, to go back and listen to that episode. I believe, um, you know, you and I talked about it briefly as well, you know, cause fear, fear, that is a real fear. Like I'm not saying, Hey, ignore all fear. Like there fear, some fear is, is real and it can be acknowledged, but it's, what is, what do we do with that fear after? Like, how do I, how do I take that fear and say, I'm going to be victorious. Like something horrible happened. I'm not going to be afraid the rest of my life. I'm not going to let one bad experience tarnish the rest of my life. Take one bad moment and carry that moment everywhere with me. And so that was, for me, that's a personal experience of overcoming my worst, the scariest fear to me. Um, and then as far as fear in business, I'll tell you, um, fear in like sharing myself, like I kind of tell myself like, listen, like I've honestly, I've been too much through too much crap for it to go to waste. Like, I feel like the, the, the years of eating disorder, the, the work that I did, the fighting I, I, I put in to, to find freedom. It's like almost like I, I, shoot, like I'll be damned if I'm not going to share it. And so when I feel insecure or I have self doubt and fear that like, oh, is what does what I do matter? Is anybody, you know, that we all think that is, am I making a difference? Like it's very easy to go down that, that kind of negative rabbit hole. I go back to like, okay, Trish, like you have something to share. You have personal things to share. You have got business perspectives to share and, and you've gone through too much to not share with other people because there are other people who are going through that right now. And for me, that's when I overcome my fear. I overcome my fear of vulnerability by saying like, okay, I know fundamentally I really want to help people and I want to love people. I can't do that unless I face my own fear. So did you actually have a fear of sharing your own true experiences with people? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Very much so. And then I had this conviction to go, okay, well, great. If you keep it to yourself, you're not going to, I mean, what good is that to you? So do you think that's one way of therapy, really talking about things or blogging about things? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do believe though, I still am a firm believer that everyone should be in therapy to some extent, even if it's just like a mental health checkup, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think in addition to that support and then it's, it's an incredible way. I mean, we have, we've, by talking about and writing about and sharing our stories, we, we were able to garnish the truths from them. You know, we can rewrite and re-experience them and take, um, what we, what we need to from them and work through the negative emotions. I mean, work through forgiveness, work through letting go of anger. I mean, there's so many, so many great personal development things that can happen from walking through a story and taking ownership of that narrative. And how do you feel about confidence and fear in terms of different personalities? Because mm. different people would like different things. And you could look at somebody and think, well, they're really confident, they're loud and they're dancing in the street. That kind right, of thing. Right. They, well, I want to be confident. Does that mean I have to do those things? But then if I do those things, I just feel wrong in all of the cells and bones in my body because it's not right. something that's natural to me. Right. That's, that's a great question. No, I, I love that. Cause and actually when I do my, my public speaking, I often start by letting people know, like confidence has nothing to do with personality type. Confidence manifests itself differently with each personality type. So right. What you described was this extrovert who's, you know, extremely outgoing and, you know, creative, like that's their, that somebody can be as just as confident as that and be introverted and quiet, but it's that confidence of how you carry yourself, of how you, honestly, I think it's a, it's a feeling. It's knowing that you have peace in your heart and you don't have to impress anyone. That you don't have to worry what anybody else thinks, but you can just be you. That's that freedom. And then being you might just might mean that you want to just be a, reading a book, you know, like that's fine. Or you might want to go dance in the streets like a madman. Both, <laughs> both, man, both expressions are okay because both expressions are, or someone saying, I feel free to be myself. And you know, I end every, my, one of my, my taglines for my business is be you, be free. And what that means to me is like, when we have that freedom, when we have the confidence to be ourselves, we can actually 
be free to express ourselves. And I really think that we're, as human beings, we're created in a way that when we express ourselves, that creative expression is like this expression of our soul, right? Like, and, and creativity, dancing the streets or reading a book, they're both in a, in a way a creative process that then gives us the ability to create and contribute. And then we're, then all of a sudden, wait, we matter. Like it's crazy what the, having freedom to be yourself will open up doors for you to have really deep, authentic relationships with people to be a truth teller in your life. And you know, to, to tell your story and follow your purpose and, and make it, you know, an impact, a little dent in this world that we live in. And can I ask you a little bit about um, confidence parent, parenting your daughter? How yeah. do you teach her to be confident? Obviously, she's quite young right now, but I'm sure you've yes, got Yes, she is quite young. Her. She's, she's yeah, almost two. <laughs> and, you know, that's a, it's a great question because there's two ways I want to look at it. Um, I've learned as a, as a new mom, it's hard. It's so hard being a mom. But I think some of the hardest, one of the, two of the hardest things about being a mom is there's a lot of loneliness because you've got a lot of mom friends, but everybody's busy and everyone's nap times are different. I mean, it's this kind of crazy chaotic world. And then what happens is that everybody gets on social media and you're, it's bragging rights to who's being a better mom. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, oh, wait, this is, I, I know this story too well. This is the same stuff I used to do with my body. We're all comparing and trying to elevate ourselves. And I was like, I'm not buying, I don't want to buy into this. And so I've, I've, so for me to be a confident mom, I have to re-coach myself on a lot of the body confidence issues that I've coached myself and my, and, and my, and others in the fitness world of saying like, you know, to, for me to be a confident mom means I just need to do the best I can that day and love my daughter well and be a great image for her to watch. Like, how do I live life? Am I choosing joy? Do I look straight? Like, am I present? Like I want for me to teach her confidence. I need to be mirroring that. And so I'm, I'm thinking, how do I be a confident mom? Well, I don't, I need to resist that temptation to compare myself or to compare. Oh my gosh, the amount of like comparison that goes on, like, Oh my gosh, your kid's speaking in sentences. My daughter only has seven words (laughs) or, you know, Oh, I'm speaking, you know, like my daughter, Ellie speaks, we speak French and English in the household. So it's like, then there's that. And I try not to bring that up because that's going to make somebody that's only, only using English. I mean, it's crazy. The sensitivity between moms because we're caught, we're caught up in what the world has taught us to do the best of comparing and just, so I'm learning to be a confident mom. I want to celebrate other moms as much as possible. So I try to be as intentional as I can to, to speak that out, you know, not to think it because we think a lot of things, but if we want to be people who are confident, we share confidence with others. So I, affirm and build up and compliment others. And I want my daughter to see that. I want, I think she's going to grow into a confident woman. If she can learn to say that we are people, we're the first people to say hi. I want to be the first people to say hi. I want to be the first person to make eye contact. I want to be the first person to smile. I want to welcome people in. I want to say, come like, I think you're beautiful. Have I told you that I like this and you're doing a great job. And if I, if I'm mirroring that for my daughter, she's going to see that. And I hope, and my, and my prayer is that she'll do that for her little friends and that that's she's that's the kind of woman she's going to grow into being and also what about um because obviously when we're born and when we're kids we are already confident we don't have any fears oh, or anything. Yeah. what age do you think that actually happens to us where we change and we start to have yeah. self-doubt and body that, awareness it's a great question i don't know because i haven't hit that yet at, at almost two, it she, we're not there yet. So, um, I mean, my guess is probably in the next two years, I'm going to see that change, but it's absolutely one of my favorite things to tell my coaching clients is listen, like, um, I know it's hard to get back up after you've fallen down. I know that you think you've failed over and over. I know that you've been struggling with weight loss, you know, on a yo-yo cycle over and over and over, but you know what I know? I know that you can do hard things. I know that you were programmed to get up every time you fall down. Cause I've watched a child learn how to walk. And the thing is, is these like babies, when they're learning to walk, they don't just fall. They freaking fall, like face plant. <laughs> they get bruises everywhere. They are, these are some bad falls, but they don't, they don't like, they don't give up. They don't think, Oh my gosh, I'm the worst. Like I'm never going to be able to walk. They just freaking just get back up. And it's like, I love using that and reminding us like, that's how we're built. So whatever it is that somebody's going through that like they're like, I can't keep getting back up. Um, I, I call I call BS on that. I think sometimes it's so refreshing to see kids go back. That's how that's how we're programmed. We know how to do this. We know how to be confident. We've lost it somewhere. I am excited to see in my parenting journey what point that starts changing. So I think it's a great question. It's just not one I can answer 
with well, a first person perspective right now but it's really interesting because um, i've got two children one of them 17 and she's confident uh, all the way up i was brought up with not much confidence and so i kind of overdid it with her and told her how great she was and she really is confident she's yeah goes out in the world as herself uh, my, my younger one she's five and she's not even aware of herself in that way yet not aware of her body or anything she says things that she just hears at school and um, I think you can hear they're coming from other families, the way that the parents speak. So I think it's just so important to speak about yourself as well around your children. And yes. be careful what you That's say. That's a great point. Absolutely. So I'm obviously very aware of the time this morning and um, yeah. taking up quite a lot of your time already um, yeah. with the time difference and everything. So if you want to just leave us lastly with your podcast and the work that you're doing and people can follow you and find you on there. Absolutely. I would love to. So um, you can find my podcast in iTunes or Stitcher Radio. It's Confidence on the Go or at my website at trishblackwell.com forward slash podcasts. And um, I my website is that trishblackwell.com. If um, I'm happy to connect with anyone, I'm best way to get in touch with me is probably email. And my email, I'm so happy to give it out is trish at trishblackwell.com. And then finally, I have a free ebook that um, I've got out and giving away right now. And it's called building a better body image. It's 50 50 ways to love yourself from the inside out. And what it is, is a one page per day read. So it's, you're like, I don't have time for a book. I don't either. So I have a one page a day for you, you know, and it's like two paragraphs with a ch action of the day, something to challenge you to put that confidence, body confidence and body awareness into action that day. And you can, anybody can get that. It's a free download. It's trishblackwell.com forward slash free book. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I yeah. wish we had more time to talk. Uh, hopefully in the future we can do uh, part two. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. would love that. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave Nicola a review on iTunes. You can also check out the show notes and get other free content on her website, fustalfit.co.uk. If you'd like to contact Nicola, email nicola at fustalfit.co.uk.